So last time, 2020, 2021, uh, projects would pay like 10% of their tokens to people who provide ETH and provide their token in a pair, in a pool. This time, people are just saying, hey, you, you might get some points if you provide liquidity and use our protocol. And, uh, you know, they, they, they're, I think that the element of mystery about what the points mean and how many tokens they, they translate into, that kind of obscurity actually helps the projects because it buys them more time and doesn't uh, require them to overcommit paying for liquidity upfront. So I, I guess your, your talk went too well, right? People listen to you and realize, yeah, f we're all overpaying for liquidity, but I think they overcorrected and they just basically said, f this, we're not gonna pay for any liquidity. So there's no pool twos anymore. Web3 offers a brand new Petri dish. Our job is to buy great tech at great prices. AI is also libertarian, right? Enable use case that people haven't been able to do today. The next hundreds of millions of players, then they will come to the market through mobile. My personal reason why I could be bullish in the next 12 months is, Welcome back to another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. I'm your host, Jason Choi. I am the co-founder of Tangent, and I'm joined once again by my co-host, Sanad, from Dragonfly. So nothing we discuss on the show is financial advice, and nothing we discuss is representative of our respective companies. They're all our personal opinions. Now, today, I know I've spoken a lot about you know how in crypto, any project with a token should be treating their token as a separate product and their product as a separate thing. Right? They, the token and the product have separate audiences, separate roadmaps. So today we want to talk about what exactly this means, because I kind of rambled on and on about this on Twitter many, many times. I think this is by far the most important determinant of what decides whether a protocol is worth billions or tens of millions. But many experienced founders still seem to miss this point, the point that they have to treat the token as a separate product, especially for founders coming from Web2 into Web3. So in today's roundtable episode, Sanat and I will break down what makes a good token and what makes a good project um, and a potentially bad token. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, you know bad projects because there's been covered at nauseum. We're not going to talk about what makes a good project because that's also been covered a lot. We're going to mostly focus on the token side of things today. So we're going to give some examples of you know great projects that we think have horrible tokens and maybe some bad projects of great tokens and maybe some actual examples of what founders should be doing. And just a heads up, this is not a definitive guide. This is more of a open-ended discussion of what we're seeing in the market, what has worked and what hasn't in terms of tokens, what it means to have a good token. But if you guys enjoy this, let us know and we're happy to do a follow-up. And if you're a VC, make sure you share this episode with your founders. If you want to raise your next fund, just half joking there. So let's set the context here, Sana. So I think many founders assume that if you build a profitable product, right, an app, a protocol or deepen network or what, what, what have you, the token will automatically be valuable since that's what happens in the startup world, right? If you hit some metrics, you hit some KPIs, your DMs are suddenly flooded with VC interns begging you to take their money. But tokens are not that way. This episode is brought to you by YGG. I'm really excited to partner with Yield Guild Games to bring you today's episode. You may remember YGG as the leading guild in Web3 that helped drive the success of games like Axie Infinity and Pixels, but they actually have much bigger ambitions than just that. I've really enjoyed co-investing with and also learning all about gaming from their founder, Gabby Desson, throughout the years. So here is YGG founder, Gabby, to tell us more about what a guild protocol actually means. Sure. So a guild protocol has several components. One is that we have our community that plays a lot of these different games and contribute in many ways. And in industry parlance, this is called player liquidity. So we provide the player liquidity to come in and play these Web3 games. We also have our questing and reputation system that we've built over the last two years. On top of that, we have assets in these different games that players can interact with so that they have a better experience and have an increased chance of having ownership. And the last part, which we're releasing later this year, is the concept called on-chain guilds. So on-chain guilds are a way for guilds to put their guild identity, wallet, and membership on-chain. And this is a way for guilds to have their permanent presence within Web3. And now back to the episode. So I guess before we dive into things, what are your thoughts on kind of treating tokens as a separate thing than the product? Like are there examples you've seen where founders do this or founders don't realize this? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, so I think whether you like it or not, your token matters in crypto. And if you're going to have a token-based project, um, the biggest mistake you can make is either just assume that your token will work out if your product works out. Um, or, um, and the thing I want to point out here is that, you know, it sometimes feels um, kind of like a misdirection 
for founders to be thinking too much about tokens and people are like, oh, these people are cash grabby. But the honest answer is that if you don't take your token seriously, you're like operating with one hand tied behind your back. Like your token is the key to liquidity for your investors. Your token is the key to liquidity for your team. Your token is the key to liquidity for yourselves. And having a strong token with key liquidity will enable you to attract not only the best investors, but actually the best team. And I think that's like super underrated. Like you have to recognize that in crypto, individuals who come here and work, and this includes the smartest, con nerdiest co smart contract engineers, everyone's here because there's a huge incentive to be here. And that incentive makes a lot more sense when the token story is good. Um, and so remember that it's actually also a hiding superpower. It's not just like one of these cash grabby things. It's like, oh, I hate this game. I have to play it. But it is literally a way to make sure you have the best team, the best investors, and the best stakeholders on your side. Yeah, I remember when we were first starting to prep for this episode, we talked about how there's examples of good projects where you have a product that works, you know, the the, the developers love it, but then the token is horrible. Uh, so there's no liquidity, it's really low value, so the war chest is small. But then on the flip side, there's like horrible projects, just absolute vaporware with nothing happening, just a white paper, but a token that's extremely liquid and valuable. I think the 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 kind of holy grail should be in the middle, right? You should have a product that actually matters, that actually have users and developers on it, but you cannot just neglect the token. And for some reason, you know, maybe it's just people refusing to play that token game because they feel like, like you said, it's like cash grabby. It's not as like tech purist. Uh, that sometimes that side gets neglected. But let's dive into the you know specifics here. In terms of a good token, in your mind, like what is a good token besides you know price going up, obviously. Interestingly enough, liquidity really comes top of mind. And this is a thing I've learned over time. When I started out in crypto, I used to spend a lot of energy thinking about complex tokenomics. Mm. And complex tokenomics can work. Um, I think, you know, when I started Curve and Frax and all these tokens with basically the kind of tokenomics and incentives programs that four people in DeFi understand and everyone else is just kind of <laughs> nodding along. I, I think those can work. But over time, I've come to realize that keeping your token relatively simple keeping incentives relatively straightforward and focusing on liquidity such that individuals, funds, and others that want to invest in your project are able to do so and are able to do so with the comfort they'll be exit, they'll be able to exit is super important. Um, and then this is a hard one to quantify and I know we'll get into this, but really just, it is true that within crypto markets, um, some, part of, uh, some part of prices is de determined by fundamentals a lot of the price is determined by your ability to keep yourself relevant in the attention economy. Um, and you don't want to go too far down playing that game exclusively, um, but ignoring that game is also probably going to hurt you in the long run. I think uh, in terms of liquidity, that's one kind of capturing attention. It's other distribution. I think it's also very important, right? How centralized your coin is, in whose hands are your tokens uh, is also incredibly important. So we're going to talk about that in a bit as, as well in terms of how do you actually get distribution in a fair way? Because there have been disastrous examples of this and also really great examples of this uh, this year. Um, so let's dive into the liquidity point first, because I, I think that's probably the biggest and most important. So the, the way I think about tokens is, like you said, it's it's not just a way for VCs to monetize or for the founders and the teams and employees to monetize. It's actually a marketing tool first, right? It's a governance tool second. And to me, it's it's kind of similar to how L1s, to me, are distribution channels first and protocols second. What I mean by that is the greatest marketing tool for a token, for an L1, is the token price going up, right? But if on, on the flip side, if the price goes down over time, it means no one who ever got involved with your community, besides maybe your pre-sale VCs, made money. So that's how you really kill interest in the organic kind of retail community, the people who actually use things and provide liquidity on your protocol, right? It doesn't matter if it's the best designed protocol. It doesn't matter if it's a great nerd snipe. It's still going to remind, remain kind of an underground hobby for a few hundred people versus a few million users. And I think a great example for that is like Definity, which they renamed to ICP. If you look at just the price chart since launch, they launched at a ridiculous valuation, very thin liquidity. And it's just been a dump fest, right? By just early investors. And if your token looks like that, um, I think I, I, I'll be very surprised to see a token with a chart that looks like that over years where there is a healthy community of builders. So people who think that, oh, it's only traders getting wrecked, it's not builders, that's actually not true because builders want to build their business on an L1 where there is a lot of people, right? So that's what I mean by L1s being distribution channels. If you have, you know, a hundred people that are very excited about your tech 
um, you know, that could be interesting for some businesses, but it's not really the insufficient as a basis. First, it's like Solana. If you have like 2 million daily active wallets um, and people who have made money and are very loyal to the community and kind of uh, con constantly test out new things in the community that in, in the ecosystem, that's a great basis for you to start a business. So you build massive companies, sorry, communities by making people rich over time. So this is kind of the fortunate and unfortunate truth of the market. And a lot of this comes down to the liquidity of the token as well. Um, but I'll take a pause there and see if you agree on that point too. Absolutely. I think that's 100% true. Um, and one thing I'll point out before we start into the specifics of liquidity itself is that, um, you know, we both worked at a fairly large liquid fund in, a prior, in our prior jobs. Um, we know a lot of people at liquid funds. I think because a lot of the a lot of the kind of conversation on CT is driven by people with smaller kind of portfolios, they don't quite realize what it takes to be a genuinely liquid token. Like the honest answer is if you run a three to four hundred million dollar liquid fund in crypto and you're going to you're not going to take positions that are smaller than five million because that's not worth it for you. The space of assets that you can comfortably invest five million dollars into into as a crypto fund and be comfortable that you're going to get out is so small. Like I remember like one and a half years ago, I think there were like 20, 30 tokens. I'm sure like in these conditions, maybe it's closer to 60, 70, but really I think people forget that like, if you want large buyers, the, like it is crazy how, like how many times I have this conversation with people at large funds where you say, Oh, this token looks interesting. And they're like, really yeah, quick. I can't buy $5 million of it. So it's like irrelevant. Um, and so I think there's like a gap between the way CT thinks about these things and actual fund managers think about these things and founders should definitely be cognizant of that. And, yeah, and you know, in an era, era where lots of OTC deals also happen, where treasuries directly sell tokens to funds, funds are thinking the same thing. They're like, okay, I'll buy five to $10 million of your token right now. Can I sell it? And if the answer is no, they're not going to buy it. It's not just funds as well. It's like whales, right? There's so many kind of quiet whales with like hundreds of millions of dollars out there. These are the guys who really kind of send tokens in the price discovery, right? First is very illiquid tokens. And when I when we say liquid, I think just to put some numbers, um, you know, I think anything above 100 million daily traded volume, I would consider like relatively liquid, still not very liquid, but like 100 million is like the basis for when you are quote unquote a serious token. Anything under that, you are still kind of very much in bootstrap mode, right? If it's under a million dollars, then I don't even consider the liquidity real because if I put in a 100K order, I'm going to send this thing by 20%. And we're going to talk about the, the issue with that later on. But uh, I think what was very interesting to me is last cycle, right? In 2020, 2021, a lot of the liquidity came down to on-chain liquidity, right? There's so many projects, every single project was incentivizing liquidity provision for retail guys, basically just guys like me sitting in my room, putting in my ETH and putting in my tokens into some sort of pool uh, on Uniswap and I get some rewards that are printed from their tokens. Um, but this cycle around, it seems like that has completely gone. Uh, so we're going to dig into a bit about what that is as well. Um, but I think a lot of that has been replaced by a focus on centralized exchanges because the market has basically realized that how valuable and liquid a token will be is almost entirely based on whether you get listed on Binance, Bybit, and OKEx. It's like the three big tier one exchanges uh, that determine the magnitude of the outcome for a token. So when I tweeted about this, uh, I think a lot of people pushed back. Right? They were just saying, uh, we got to move away from these centralized cabal. This is like anti-crypto. Um, I'm not saying this is like a good thing we should be endorsing, but this is the reality of the market, right? Like I, I think you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum will be a fraction of their size if we didn't have a single centralized exchange, right? If it's all just like DEXs and P2P uh, transactions like back in 2009 for Bitcoin. So centralized exchanges are very much the gatekeeper to liquidity, the gatekeepers to volume. So I think we should dig into that game a little bit just because um, it, it's it's quite opaque uh, to to kind of the general listener out there. What, what are some of your biggest lessons or thoughts kind of helping some of your portfolio companies navigate the centralized exchange challenge? I'll just start by saying I'll echo exactly what you said, where there are there are certainly case studies of teams having done it differently. Um, there are teams on Solana that I foresee will probably do very well with a Jupyter launchpad token in the next few in the next year. Um, so there are like a handful of tokens that will succeed without going the centralized exchange route. Um, but it is true that the default success case for a liquid for a token that we describe as liquid in the definitions we kind of outlined previously 
is being listed on one of those three exchanges. And so that's definitely the straight path. And so if you're not going to take the straight path, you should be thinking very deeply about why you're doing that. And I guess the, the big question people have probably now is like, how do you get listed, right? So I think there's a lot of funds and influencers out there that like promise, hey, we can get you a listing on this exchange. I can tell you on this show right now that everyone who says this is a scammer. Like nobody can guarantee you a listing. If they do, they're probably inside dealing. They're part of that exchange. They'll get fired, if not go to jail, right? So don't believe anyone who tells you they can even sway the odds in your favor, right? So you, they can connect you with the team. They could they could help you uh, kind of game plan how to create liquidity for the token in order to increase your odds. That's how they can help you sway the odds. But if they say, hey, I can I have a I have a dealer on the inside of this exchange, I can get you listed. So don't don't listen to that. There's no kind of uh, I think I think there was a lot of this back in 2017. But now um, I think e there's a lot of self regulation amongst the big tier exchanges because they know that if uh, they constantly list insider tokens and the insiders get rich and they dump on their users who come in and trade their tokens. They lose users over time. So it's bad for business. Um, so that's that's kind of for the tier one exchange listing. So how do you actually get listed? I think what I heard on the street is that, you know, the the requirements vary, but it's, it's to the magnitude of things like 100 million tra daily trading volume for seven days in a row before you start to get considered seriously. Or if you have a very, very high profile project with very good uh, venture backing. So you, you have to kind of validation from credible people, then they would, you know, they might reach out to you and discuss with you uh, before you launch. And obviously a lot of these exchanges probably require to, you to have a market maker, uh, to engage the services of a market maker to make sure there is liquidity there. But those are kind of the very basic prerequisites. Um, anything to add there? I think one specific thing I'm going to talk about that I don't think many people know about is that the structure of the deals with the listing teams is often that you give them a percentage of your token supply. Some percentage of that is used for the team itself. Some percentage of that goes to rewards as exchange users. Um, invariably, that percentage sounds high. Um, and, it, you know, we I, I, I won't say a specific number because it's honestly varied between one and seven. So it like depend, depends on a lot mm. of factors. But broadly, when founders hear that number, they're shocked. They're like, what, like, why would I pay this much money to an exchange for doing what feels like effectively nothing on their part? And I honestly empathize with those founders a lot. Um, and I think founders should make their own decisions about how this stuff should go down and figure out which exchange makes sense for them. But the honest math of the situation is that if you were to give one of these top three exchanges that percentage of your token supply, your FTV would probably be higher in a way that kind of neutralizes having giving, given them that. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing to optimize for, but it is a good starting point to understand that the reason that deal looks like that is because those exchanges know that as well. They know that your token valuation and your token launch and your token liquidity will be worth way more than the small percentage they're asking for. So it sucks, but it's also just like kind of the way the game goes. And as I said, you can choose whether you want to play it or not, but it's worth being aware and thinking about the deal, at least from first principles. Yeah, I guess to just to put that into example, like if you have a token that's at 100 million valuation on some deck somewhere and you pay 5% of that, so you pay 5 million out of your own treasury to an exchange in order to get listed and they use that 5% to do whatever, market making or rewards or as a fee, um, you know, it, it, it could increase the probability of your token to be trading at like 500 million instead. So that increase in FTV that increase in valuation often enough kind of makes up for the amount that you act actually have to pay. So obviously that's not guaranteed. I think the better way to think about this is like exchanges are a price discovery machine. It's an accurate price discovery machine versus if you have a liquidity pool on Uniswap with like 100K in liquidity, sure, you can, you can very easily engineer a very high market cap, but uh, once you get any type of liquidity in a real market, then the valuation probably changes. So the what's good about exchanges is the fact that they have so many users and so much liquidity and they help you actually price discover. So I think outside of those top three exchanges, it's getting very hard to get very liquid and sensible markets, even for tier one exchanges like Coinbase. So I would not consider Coinbase a tier one exchange in the same way I consider Binance, OKEx and Bybit tier ones in a liquidity sense. From a reputation sense, from a regulatory sense, um, Coinbase is definitely tier one, right? They're a public company now. They're like, the um the flag bearer of the industry but they have kind of become a 
uh, they, they've become a very different entity altogether uh, compared to these you know, more Chinese affiliated exchanges because they're more concerned about compliance now right, as a public company. So I think they're more likely to list a token that they think has a very low probability of being categorized as a security a few years from now versus just listing whatever is the hottest in the market, which is you know what the uh, kind of tier one, top three exchanges are doing. Um, and then on that market making point as well, um, do you guys kind of, for, for you when you talk to portfolio companies, do you recommend that your portcos talk to market makers, engage market makers? When is a good time to kind of engage these guys? As you alluded to earlier, if you are going to do the centralized exchange listing in conjunction with their team, um, a market maker is just a part of, like you have to prove to the exchange that you have market makers who are willing to provide liquidity. Um, we always encourage our teams to talk to many market makers um, and get a full picture from the market. There's a handful who basically um, do the majority of token launches, but there's quite a lot of competition between them. So make sure you leverage that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't have much more to say other than like, if you want to get listed on one of these exchanges, you have to have a market maker. So if you want to do that, just kind of suck it up and do it as well as you can. For founders who might not be familiar with this market making game, the usual deal is you loan them a percentage of your tokens, right? And this percentage can vary. And obviously, uh, you, you basically lend them the tokens, they help you trade this token around, and they have a strike price, right? So for instance, if you loan them a token at uh, with a dollar strike price, and uh, your token in six months, let's say the loan expires in six months, so the token trades at uh, $3, they can exercise the strike at one to buy your token at one and sell it at three, right? So that's how they make the big bucks for market makers. So that's the gen gen generic deal. Uh, and obviously the percentages vary, the strike prices is negotiated, um, but I think a big uh, misconception from founders is that market makers will make your token volume go up. Um, so there are some market makers that do wash trading, right? They take your tokens and they trade, 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 trade. You can usually see this uh, on a chart, right? If, if it's just like very inorganic type of price action, you know it's wash trading. So the legit market makers don't really do a wash trading. That's not really what they do. What they do is add def to the book, right? So when a big fund comes in, like Sanat said, right? If someone tries to buy 5 million tokens, it's the market maker's job to make sure that there is, you know, $5 million worth of sales, not too far away from the current market price to fill those sales so that you don't have massive volatility. Um, so that's what contributes to healthy uh, kind of price discovery, right? So I, I think a lot of people misunderstand what market makers are actually for. They're not there to add volume. That still needs to come from you being able to command attention for your token. So... Speaking of attention, uh, I think one interesting thing is that the market's attention has moved away from DEXs to sexes. Um, did you notice that as well? Like I, I, I didn't really kind of, I, I was aware of this, but I wasn't very consciously acknowledging this until recently when I looked and I realized that there's not too many projects paying for liquidity in pool twos anymore like uh, last time around. Yeah, 100%. Um, it's sad in some ways because I like a future of crypto where we're trading on chain and not off chain. Um, but unfortunately, you're a hundred percent right. It's funny, like when one of the first things I spent a lot of energy on when I got into crypto two and a half years ago was studying a lot of these pool two models. I'd even given a talk about how, like, oh, you're probably overpaying for pool two liquidity. There are smarter ways to figure this out. Um, and at that point, everyone was like, "Oh my god, it's abhorrent to pay market makers like or loan market makers three percent of your token." But it's better for us to give away like ten percent of our token supply to people, just like randomly providing liquidity in Uniswap V2 who run away the day the incentives um, incentives run out. Um, and so, yeah, 100% agreed that it is sad in some ways, but right now the meta truly is centralized exchanges. And I, I'd say the, the on-chain meta has moved on to points as well, which we talked about a lot, right? Points versus airdrops. So last time, 2020, 2021, uh, projects would pay like 10% of their tokens to people who provide ETH and provide their token in a pair, in a pool. This time people are just saying, hey, you, you might get some points if you provide liquidity and use our protocol. And, uh, you know, they, they, they're, I think that the element of mystery about what the points mean and how many tokens they, they translate into, that kind of obscurity actually helps the projects because it buys them more time and doesn't uh, require them to overcommit paying for liquidity upfront. So I, I guess your, your talk went too well, right? People listen to you and realize, yep, shit, we're all overpaying for liquidity. But I think they overcorrected and they just basically said, fuck this, we're not going to pay for any liquidity. So there's no pool twos anymore. Um, but I think the the flip side of that is there are exceptions where people might have been considered to be uh, overpaying for liquidity, but in hindsight, I think uh, was ended up being a pretty good outcome. So a good case study is like Illuvium, 
Um, so they were 100% overpaying, right? They were offering people who provided liquidity on their liquidity pool, like 300% APY. Um, and they front loaded that for the first two years. And this is before Illuvium launched their game, launched anything. It was just the token. Um, so it it could have uh, it could have killed the kind of longevity of the token. But today it's still trading at an 800 million fully diluted valuation at a very, very liquid uh, basis. Um, and I think what they did well was they really separated the product, their game, uh, from the token. So I think they it's almost like they have two separate teams, right? One that just pushed the token first and then just spent hours thinking about how to introduce token sinks. The other was just building the, the, the game. At least from the outside, it, it, it seemed that way. So some of the things they did was, uh, for instance, they would allow you to optionally lock up your tokens for 12 months um, to increase your weightage if you provide liquidity. So if you lock up some tokens, in addition to providing liquidity, you get more rewards. And in order to solve the problem of having too many tokens locked up and being too liquid, they have a staked uh, alluvium that you can use to buy things in-game. So you can still use the token in-game even if it's staked. So I thought that was very, very thoughtful. Um, that was done very, very well. Um, so obviously, market secure clarity, the price went up and went down, whatever. But uh, in terms of like on-chain campaigns that translated to uh, centralized exchange campaigns that that kind of preceded its product launch. I think Illuvium was probably one of the better examples out there. I don't know if you've seen any other examples of like um, liquidity campaigns done well as well. None come to mind, if I'm being totally honest. I mostly just like think about how much value we gave away last cycle and all these DeFi protocols that just kind of gave away 10, 15, 20% of their token supply paying for these Uniswap V2 liquidity pools. And a lot of those tokens are now illiquid because they ran out of incentives. And so um, there's no liquidity there. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that we find a way to do this better on chain um, in the near future. But right now, um, a lot of the models for incentivizing liquidity on chain feel pretty broken. Yeah. And like you said, a lot of it has become centralized exchange meta. And one example is like BitTensor, right? TAO Tao. Uh, well, I know you have some thoughts on how the token um, kind of was launched. Do you want to kind of walk through that? Well, I thought it was super interesting because they... Um, just like launch that token on day one. Um, I don't know if people know, Tao has been around for a very long time. Yeah, it was launched on, yeah, it was launched exactly actually um, like in March of last year. Um, so Tao kind of just, when they launched their product, they just launched their token. And they, they, were a, they did a good job of reaching out to a whole bunch of smart people in the space, explaining what they're working on. Um, the token was super illiquid. They didn't really do anything about it. But that, but the fact that they managed to capture a spot in the attention economy and had people excited about the token meant that they both um, managed to get some funds to buy it, even a very liquid token because the kind of pricing dynamics were interesting and it was such an early launch, um, as well as kind of got a whole bunch of retail participants to, to get excited about the token. And the interesting thing about Tao to me is that if you look at the price chart for all time, um, Tau is up 670% one year from one year ago, which is obviously like a crazy return. And that means that a whole bunch of the participants who got in early and took the risk of buying an illiquid token, or and the interesting thing is that it's not so much of a fund, so it's not a risk for a retail participant. Like a retail participant can buy a small quantity of this token and know that they can always exit. Um, and over the year, they got more and more people excited. And in fact, there was so much organic demand that we've seen other protocols like TensorFlex come up which are actually building liquidity pools for Tau, incentivizing Tau liquidity themselves via liquid staking token. And this token grew in price organically all the way to the point where eventually it just got a centralized exchange listing. And I think the interesting dynamic here is that this is a super rare example, um, at least in the recent meta, of a token where a lot of value was a available to anyone who was willing to buy the token early. And the token was in the public market. So it's interesting because Tao has listed in on centralized exchanges like Binance in the last month. In the last month, it's down 30%. <laughs> but in the last year, it's still up 670%. So if you believed in Tao one year ago and you kind of bet on the team correctly, um, you made a lot of money. Whereas like, this is the one time where if you waited for centralized exchange stuff, it was almost too late. We'll see how it plays out, obviously, in the near future. And this is market stuff. Um, again, I, I'm a little hesitant to talk too much about Tao because I think Tao was like pretty excellently executed. But make no mistake, it's pretty hard. You have to have 
a lot of organic demand. You have to get the right people on your side. So this is an example of, you know, earlier we were saying the centralized, going for the centralized exchange listing initially is kind of the, the straight path. Um, this is not the straight path and it worked super, super well for them. And I kind of respect the team, at least on the token front for like playing this game very well and managing to get the right funds involved and incentivizing everyone. Um, but for every Tau, there are like 10 teams that just kind of launched a token and said, hey, let's see what happens. And those tokens are languishing. We don't even know about them. Um, mm. And so yeah. you can play this game, but you have to be careful. Yeah, I'd say there are way more than 10 teams. And for every tile, there's probably 200 AI coins that just didn't go anywhere. And I think that's actually a very good differentiation between liquidity and volume. So everything we talked about in terms of engaging market makers, getting listed, maybe providing incentives for on-chain, that was all just liquidity. Liquidity is not volume. Liquidity is how much capacity there is for volume. Volume comes from attention. Right, as whether you're able to get people interested. So the analogy to kind of public markets is like your investor relations team, right? You have people working at public markets, just kind of talking to hedge funds all the time, talking to big funds all the time, people who have capital and people who have their own distribution. So I think a lot of founders also don't understand this, right? There's very, very technical projects out there with very technical founders that are just heads down building their own thing and they suck at marketing, right? For a long time, Nier was that project, right? Nier was like the big nerd snipe. Everybody in the developer community was like, oh, this is the best experience ever. Um, but they just sucked at marketing. They just never bothered to tell people what they're building. I remember there was some pretty big announcement back in like 2022 with partnerships and they barely even talked about it. And somewhere along the way, they realized, actually, uh, we're making a big mistake, right? We just focus on product, not the token. And their marketing team just snapped, right? This year, they just memes after memes <laughs> with the like, uh, I don't know if you saw the Jensen Huang touched the shoulder of Ilya, the founder of Nier. <laughs> that became a whole thing. So they've become very good at kind of capturing attention. And I, I think the two go hand in hand, right? It's, I think a lot of people scoff at the attention game, but that is how you get people to talk about your community, to start trying things out in your community, and that snowballs into a distribution channel where builders want to come. Right. So I think the big opportunity that I see is actually deep in networks. So for some reason, uh, the, the, there's a huge gap between the fundamentals in deep in and volume in deep in. So if you look at things like Hive Mapper, which you've talked about a lot in the show, I think they are you know growing pretty significantly in terms of their node count. They're trading like a million dollars a day. Right, which is like nothing. Um, and then similarly for GOD, which is a, a token that I hold, they're working on an RTK network, which is helping refine uh, geolocation data with kind of uh, on the ground nodes, right? So for instance, if you use your GPS and you're off by like 10 meters, uh, GOD is that network to help you refine the last 10 meters, right? So it's good for like agriculture and whatnot. And they actually have paying users, right? Last I checked, I think they have a million dollars in ARR, but the token trades less than half a million. Um, so there's so many examples of this with Akash as well, right? One of the biggest uh, GPU networks in crypto also trade nothing uh, because they were only out of osmosis until the Coinbase listing, which is still kind of quite low. So for some reason, um, you know, the deep in networks can't seem to crack this volume and liquidity game. Do you, wh why do you think that is? I, I kind of have some theories, but I'm curious, why do you think deep in seems to be uh, the biggest kind of offender of this? I have two kind of explanations, both of which I'm, like half short of. One is that um, the thing about deepen networks is that if you actually want to run your deepen network, your token has to go live. So for a lot of protocols where the token is maybe governance or just kind of a way to invest in the protocol, um, you can kind of wait. You can run your protocol for a year. You can run your protocol for two years and launch the token after that. Um, you can't do that for a deepen network. Like deepen networks basically literally need that token to be live to have the, the product work. And so they have to launch super early which makes it more challenging for these founders. We've also found that deep in founders very often in a good way are the most product focused entrepreneurs in crypto. At least I've met a lot of them and they really have a vision for how their product can kind of create an excellent marketplace that actually does efficient allocation of resources. And many of them think crypto is just like, the crypto token is just a nice way to facilitate value transfer there. And that's kind of the way they think about it. And so then, less versed in these token games. Um, I don't know, how. what have you found? I absolutely agree. I think it's more of the latter point, right? I, I, the serious deep in networks, at least, right? The ones that I mentioned are built by people with, you know, maybe a decade in experience, if not more, in their respective fields. Because it's, it's it, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier to start like a decentralized exchange or like a, you know, AMM than it is to bootstrap like a geolocation network, 
uh, you know, on the ground, right? Because that requires hardware knowledge, that requires industry context. It's more like a Web2 startup with a token than a Web3 startup. So a lot of the guys came over from Web2 uh, with, a, with, with a great kind of execution capabilities on how to actually build this network and they ignore the token game, right? So I think it's, it's a founder market fit kind of thing. Um, so the founders are great fit with uh, the, the, the product, but they're not great fits with the token. And that's what's unique about crypto is you kind of need someone who can play the product game and the token game. So I think one good thing that these networks can do is to engage with investors who know the token game, who can help them and also hire crypto natives, right? And just because you have launched a token and it's a liquid and you know it's been kind of languishing for a year, doesn't mean it's game over, right? There, there have been stories of tokens getting revived before. I think BitTensor is like a great example of this. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see something happen there. I'm personally, I really enjoy talking to deep end founders just because these guys are usually the most purists, right? They, they really believe in it. Um, and I, I get just fired up talking to people like that. But I guess in the interest of time, let's move on to the second big point besides liquidity, which is distribution. So we've talked a lot about how to distribute tokens with airdrops. I think people are familiar with our views, uh, at least for those who are, of you who are following the show, you know how we feel about airdrops. Um, I think there's two good examples to illustrate how to do this well and how to do this poorly. The first one is Starkware, and they seem to have a major, major fuck up. Um, so I, I kind of tangentially followed the story, but what, what, what happened there? Why are people so mad about Starkware? I'll start by saying, you know, one of the challenges of talking about these things is that the market has a crazy way of just kind of going off into its own, um, like, like the, these things can turn into worse, vicious or virtuous cycles. And so people start like hating on Starkware and then, I don't know, at least the CT narrative is like Starkware is dead. There was this meme floating around recently that Starkware has eight active users, which is false, just to be clear. They don't have a lot <laughs> of active users, but they also don't have eight. Um, but I think what happened is that, you know, um, I think Starkware made two key mistakes. One is that they didn't even do the very little work that is now involved with at least trying to not reward civil actors. Um, and so I think um, that left a bad taste in a lot of users' mouth, where there were lots of actors who had done very, very tiny transactions, had not mm -hmm. actually put capital at risk, or had not actually tried to use the network, who got very significant airdrops. Um, and that annoys the people who actually spent a lot of time on Starkware. And then Starkware made, made an interesting mistake, um, where I think they went too far on the incentivizing developer side and not incentivizing users. And some of this is also just kind of in communication where a lot of the users of Starkware have complained that they just feel like the team hates them. And the team hates them. Like I, the users say the team hates yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's been so about recently. Like people are just like, yeah, the team hates the users because when they, like, when the, when people were complaining about the airdrop, I think the team basically conveyed that like, you guys should be grateful for getting anything, you know, like you don't, like you're not actually important here. And I think that's just silly. Like you have to realize that like the users of your blockchain are the users of your blockchain and they have many, many places to be putting their capital and many places to be trying out applications. Um, and so I think a really interesting post, um, so there's an ex Uniswap developer who's kind of building um, a super interesting DEX on Starkware and he's building, building there for two years. And he said um, some pretty, like he wrote this long governance post and he sounded pretty bummed out. Like he basically, I'm going to quote directly, when I started building on Starknet in May about a year ago, I took a bet on impressive technology and I believe the airdrop would be the catalyst for more users to try Starknet. However, after seeing the design of the user airdrop, I think the chances for Starknet to read product market fit have diminished. Many real users wow. were neglected by the airdrop and the successful Sybils were heavily rewarded. And he actually had a proposal that I thought was super interesting where um, he kind of has these five criteria about like making sure that airdrops should be based on how much capital someone risked, not reward civils, should not punish deployment of capital to dApps, should kind of stimulate activity on the chain over time, and should make early users rich. And I think this stuff continues to leave a bad taste in people's mouth, but people should remember that BNB and Link have like the crazy strongest communities in crypto to this day. And a lot of that is just that they made their early users rich. Um, and so, you know, last time we discussed airdrops, we said like, yeah, you're always going to have users hate you for it some subset of users is going to be angry um, and it's okay. You can deal with that. And it's not the most important thing, but you also don't want to be the worst airdrop. Like you don't want to be the one where the users really feel like all the users feel like they were cheated. And the one that is like heralded as an example of this is not a way to do things. Um, 
Wow, I'm just looking at the proposal as well. As you said that the five points are quite interesting. So when they say must not punish deployment of capital to dApps, how, how did Starkware punish deployment of capital? Um, I think basically you were more rewarded in some weird way for just bridging versus actually like using dApps. And they did like Excellent. account for that probably in their calculations. I don't know all the specific details, unfortunately. <laughs> I see. I see. That's that is interesting to hear from a builder, right? Because I think that the general feedback from uh, kind of L ones or infrastructure designing these airdrops is that well, airdrops is just for the farmers and speculators, right? We don't really care about them. We're more builder aligned, and uh, but then when you look at like actually who gets impacted the most, it's the builders, right? If if, if you piss off the potential users, then they're they don't, they don't want to base their business on you. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And on the flip side, obviously. We have the Athena, um, Athena example. I don't know if we still have to make a disclaimer because every episode we talk about Athena, we make a disclaimer that we're both investors. But for Athena, they, I think their launch was widely lauded as one of the best launches in terms of like how the token goes, right? So I think 30% of the Athena token was allocated to developing the ecosystem. And then the first 5% was airdropped to Athena users. Uh, and they have very specific criteria on how to earn points on that. And then they have also subsequent seasons. So it's not just like one shot, it's done, right? They have constant ways to engage attention of the community. Um, so I thought that was extremely well designed. And I feel like that must have been inspired by blurs because um, the, uh, the concept of seasons wasn't really a thing before blur as well. But curious, as an investor, do you have any thoughts on how Athena went about their launch as well? I think... Um... You know, I think it was very well executed. And I think um, the super underrated part of Athena's airdrop that I've heard from people who participated in the protocol is just clear communication. Um, mm -hmm. They were a team that said, hey, we will launch, like, we're launching our protocol. You can put capital in. We have the following criteria. Either we'll reach a certain amount in TVL or a certain amount of time will pass. And once one of those things happens, we will launch our token. They then did launch their token. Their shard campaign was super clearly explained about like what kind of behaviors they're looking to incentivize. And I think, you know, we've seen, um, like to contrast this with all the debate that's been happening around MarginFi recently. Um, you know, I think users just appreciate when you can communicate clearly saying, hey, this is our plan. This is what we're trying to incentivize. And this is when we launch a token. Like it sounds so simple, but a lot of teams have struggled to do that. And I think actually Athena did a really good job just communicating clearly with users. And then, like doing what it said it would do. <laughs> and what happened with Martin Fi, just for those of us who are not, uh, did not follow the story? Yeah, I mean, so I think Margin Fi has effectively been running a points program for a very, very long time and promising a token. Mm. Um, and users got increasingly frustrated um, with the team's kind of, the team just like wouldn't launch a token. And very often the founders kind of, in a similar way to Starkware, maybe kind of came out and said, look, all these, like, we don't want all these farmers. We have very little interest in kind of people who are just using our protocol for the token. You should leave. I, I think it left a bad taste in people's mouths. And then there was kind of a weird incident that got very convoluted. And I don't know the actual where it landed up, where there was a protocol that was supposed to be, Margin was supposed to be giving incentives to its users on behalf of a protocol. And they kind of didn't do that for two weeks. Um, and then the, the one of the kind of core team of MarginFi had, um, effectively a breakdown on Twitter. It was actually kind of tough to see. I hope he's doing okay. Um, and I think the interesting thing after that was just like, there were all these users who were like, yeah, I'm done with margin file. Like these guys have been promising me a token. I've been farming them forever. They've like rugged me on points. I feel let down. I'm just going to go use another lending market. And I think uh, the thing that really strikes me as um, not great there is like, we discussed this, how like points have kind of moved far some, some ways in the back of founders where effectively they're now farming users by just giving mm -hmm. away these points with, when no one knows what happens. I think you can abuse that part. And it felt like margin five possibly abused that part. <laughs> yeah, I think there, it really comes down to um, kind of being very transparent, but maintaining that flexibility, right? So I think with Athena, they specifically mentioned what you need to do to kind of multiply your points and by how much, right? So with things like, uh, you know, uh, depositing liquidity and then staking the token, but then there's like other, like ten other activities, um, that uh that that they kind of outlined from day one, and it wasn't without hiccups. Right? I remember, uh, they kind of manually changed uh one of the initial APYs, and uh, a lot of people kind of had an outcry. But what they did was like they were very transparent. Hey, we fucked up. We're gonna you know change it back. Um, so I think like you said, by communicating with the community, kind of treating it 
as if you're the investor relations person for a public company is exactly the way I would think about it. I think that the last point I, I kind of talk about in terms of distribution is like who you want your tokens to be in, uh, in whose hands do you want your tokens to be in as well? Because I think a great example of this is like Telegram, right? Telegram's ton network. Uh, you know, one of our block crunch guys actually did analysis on the supply of the ton token because we were very curious about how this is one of the most uh, valuable protocols in crypto. It was like twenty billion dollars, but trades like something that is at a, that is a hundredth of the size, right? If you compare to um, some of the other protocols in that in that region of valuation, and it turns out like ninety six percent of the supply was distributed to miners, and then about eighty five percent, according to uh, Michael, which we'll link the tweet below, uh, of the token supply is potentially held by interconnected mining groups. So it's kind of just one big cabal holding all your tokens. So that kind of gets people nervous and makes it a little bit difficult for um, kind of organic community to come in and really participate if there's this constant threat of an overhang and kind of lack of transparency. Um, so so yeah, I think in terms of like, I think the, the, for, for founders, the equivalent of that is like giving away too much tokens uh, in your initial VC rounds, right? So that's why I always recommend that if founders want to raise a big round, raise at a bigger valuation, which means that uh, for the initial rounds, you want to raise smaller, lower valuations. Don't try to raise too much cash too early on, right? Just revert back to the Web2 wisdom of raising a small round, getting to uh, kind of some sort of MVP, getting some sort of traction, maybe some sort of test net, and then raise your bigger round. But versus a lot of founders try to raise like uh, $5 million at like 20 million valuation. You just give away too much to just a handful of VCs too early on. So that's another thing for people to take away. All right, so in the interest of time, why don't we wrap up with some takeaways for founders? So for people who are listening into this episode, what what do you want founders to take away? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we really said the most important thing at, at the beginning, which is that if you are going to be running a crypto startup that launches a token, take the token seriously. Um, and remember that it's like key to building a long lasting community, key to being able to hire the best people in the space. Um, key to be able, being able to attract the best investors in the space and key to kind of running a high quality company in crypto, honestly. Um, lots of founders have built great products and haven't thought deeply enough about the token and have struggled after that. And you don't want to be in that situation. It's kind of the key one for me. Yeah. And I guess on my side, um, it's kind of thinking about the token and the product as separate roadmaps, right? So make sure your team has internal roadmaps that are separate uh, for how you want to launch your token, how you want to maintain your token. Um, similar to your product, it's not a launch it and they'll come kind of thing, right? There needs to be constant maintenance and communications. And uh, hopefully this episode was helpful for that. Uh, if you guys have any more questions for that, uh, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. And if you want to follow up to this, happy to dive into more examples because I think we left out maybe like five or 10 examples that we didn't have time to cover. But hopefully you guys enjoy this and we'll see you in the next episode. Hey, thanks for supporting another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a five star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're listening to this on. It really helps us a lot. Or if you prefer YouTube, you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube as well to not miss an episode. I'd love to hear from you guys as well. And I personally make sure to read every single comment on YouTube or tweets that are directed at me. So feel free to leave a comment there. Let us know what project you want us to bring on or what trends you want us to talk about or tweet at me at Mr. Jason Choi or at The Block Crunch on the platform previously known as Twitter, currently known as X. And thank you so much for supporting and I'll see you in the next episode.